they, they plan. They have a plan for being generous. Um, and so I may have given the impression that giving spontaneous and sporadically is, is not good or is, is not worth anything, which is completely wrong. I hope that all of us, when we see a need, when we see uh, someone in need or something that needs to happen, we just spontaneously give and are generous because that's, that's just a huge deal. Uh, you know, how, how horrible would the world be if people didn't give when they, when they saw a need just spontaneously and sporadically? Uh, my, my point was that Generous people and not generous people give that way. The difference is generous people really have a plan. They structure their life with generosity. You know, they structure their finances with generosity uh, being the first thing in their mind. So anyway, I wanted to, I wanted to try to clarify that if I, if I had messed up on, uh, on communicate and all that. We are uh, done with our study of Philippians. We really took our time getting through that book. It was a really rich book. And I, I want to take this little, you know, summertime, uh, summertime is a strange time, everybody's traveling and stuff, and so it's, it's a little, little different. Uh, I want to take a few weeks, about three weeks, maybe four max, to address something that, you know, occasionally people will communicate to me needs that they would love to hear about, you know, the subjects or things that they would love to, love to, you know, study about, to hear about. And uh, one of the things that I, I picked up on the last few months is a, a few people saying, you know, I, I would really like to understand just the Bible better. I mean, we, you know, we'll, we'll take a book and we'll study through it. I'd really like to understand the, the whole big picture, the story of the Bible. I, I pick up the Bible and I, I try to read and I really don't know what in the world I'm I don't know context. I don't know where, what, where, where this is coming from. And, uh, and so I just want to take just three or four, four weeks to, in a sort of big picture way, talk about the Bible and the books of the Bible, kind of like the exact opposite of when we were studying two verses at a time in Philippians, okay? Kind of just the polar opposite of that, to sort of get a big picture. Because, you know, some of you, um, you've read through the Bible 15, 20 times. Uh, and so you've read parts of Scripture hundreds of times. Uh, and, and some of you... Even, even though you may have grown up in church, still don't really have a very clear idea of the Bible, and, and maybe, if, if, especially if you haven't grown up in church, you just, just really don't know. And so, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something. I hope you're not insulted. If you know the Bible really, really well, don't be insulted. I'm just going to assume that all of us know just very little about the Bible. And we're just going to kind of start, start from the ground zero and just try to get an idea of the story. Now, there's a reason for this. I tell you many times that it's my hope that your exposure to God's Word is not limited to here, to what happens in here. I, my, my desire, my hope, my prayer is that you let God speak to you through His Word at home, other places where you are, that, that in your easy chair that you can sit and you can read the Bible and you can understand, generally understand what you're reading and you can apply it to your life. You can do that when you're sitting at the breakfast table early in the morning or when you're laying in bed late at night or when you're under a tree or when you're at work on lunch break or whenever that the time is for you that's good. For you to, because we really believe, we really believe that the Bible is hugely important in our understanding of God, in our understanding of God's will for our lives, in our, in our we just believe that when we, when we encounter God's word, we let it sink in, God changes us. He changes us through his, through his word as we submit ourselves to it. And so I, it's my hope that we can just feel a little bit more comfortable with the Bible, with the purpose that you will be more in Zach's terms, purposeful. Live purposefully and letting God speak to you on a more daily basis, on a regular basis, and not just, not just here. Okay, so uh, let's just start with the beginning, all right? Gonna, gonna go all teacher mode on you here. Okay, here we go. The Bible. All right, this very large book. Now, we have ways of, of making it small, but it, it's really tiny print when it gets small. It's, it's a big book, okay? And it's a big book because it's made of six, whoops, I almost passed there, made of 66 smaller books. Some of these books are like one page long. Some of these books are like 100 pages long. I mean, you know, there's some big books, but 66 books in this Bible. Now, we, we uh, 
Well, first off, it was, it was written, the Bible was written over a period of about approximately 1,600 years, 1,600 years that the, the writings of the Bible stretch from around 1500 B.C., 1500 years before Christ was born, to around 100 A.D., 100 years after, after Jesus was born. This, these 66 books were, were written. And we generally divide the Bible into two large sections. The Old Testament, which is that stuff before Jesus, and the New Testament, which is, which is Jesus and, and the beginning of the church. So we have the Old Testament and the New Testament, and the Old Testament really starts with the beginning. I mean, the beginning of time, the beginning of our world, and tells of the fall of, of, of humans, and then quickly gets into the history of this certain group of people, the Israelites, the Jews, and God working through their lives to bring rescue to the rest of the world. And we're going to be, that's kind of what we're going to be talking about. Okay. The New Testament begins with Jesus' birth. We have four books that talk about Jesus' birth and his life and his death and his resurrection. And then goes into the beginning of the church. The Acts is kind of this history of the beginning of the church. And the latter books of the New Testament are a bunch of letters. A bunch of letters that were written to churches to help them apply the message of Jesus to their particular situations. We were studying through the book of Philippians over the last six months, and that was one of those little letters written to a church to address their situations, which we can then use to address our situations. Um, most of the Old Testament, that first section, most of the Old Testament was written in the language Hebrew. Okay? Small section was written in a similar language called Aramaic. They're, they're very similar languages. So Hebrew is the main language the Old Testament was written in. And the New Testament was written at a time when the whole Mediterranean world spoke Greek. And so it just made really good sense for the writers to write in Greek. And lots of different people could be able to read it. So the New Testament is written in, in Greek. Now, the fact that the Bible was written in another language, in other languages, okay, is the reason why we have lots of versions of the Bible, lots of translations of the Bible. And, and these translations are just translating from the original language into ours. And groups of Bible scholars, you know, uh, guys and gals who know Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic really well, would get together and they would translate the text. And they would have different philosophies as to how they would translate it. And I want to just kind of explain that briefly. Um, we're going to call it, some, some uh, groups of, of scholars translated the Bible, translated in a very, what we call, literal way. They tried to, to, to uh, translate Greek word to English word, Greek word to English word, as much as possible. Just make it as literal as possible. Versions like the English Standard Version, that's probably the most, most uh, modern but literal translation that's in there now. New American Standard Bible, New Revised Standard, even the King James Version if you lived in 1611, you know, you know, really translated English to, to Greek. Um, on the other end of the spectrum are what I'm going to call free translations. Not that they're free as in money free, okay? Free as in, hey, we're, we're going to read this in, in Greek. We're going to read this in Hebrew. What was the writer trying to communicate? And we're just going to write it in good, modern, contemporary language that anybody can understand. English that anybody can understand. We're just going to put it in, in just normal language, the thought. We're not going to worry about trying to translate word for word. We're just going to get the idea and put it in English. Those are really free translations, like the CEV, Contemporary English, Good News Bible, are really free. Uh, a lot of you may have the message which it's even freer, it's even off, off the chart of this just a little bit. It was just translated by one guy uh, and, and, uh, uh, in, a, in very modern language. Really good, I really like the message. But it's not, it's not a study Bible, okay? It's, uh, when the, the more free the translation gets, the more of a commentary it becomes because it, it involves more interpretation. You, you can't translate without interpreting. And the freer you get with your interpretation, in your translation, the more you, you have to interpret. That's not a bad thing. That's just something you've got to know. That, hey, I might get a little bit of the translator's bias in this because they're being pretty free with the translation. Now, in the middle of these two extremes are a lot of translations that try to walk a, a middle ground. They try to communicate the original thought really closely to the original language as much as they can, but 
try to put it in very understandable English, in very contemporary English. Uh, the NIV, which I usually use, that I usually have projected on the screen when I, when I do, is, is kind of my, my central study Bible. Is when I'm studying the Bible, it has the, it's a little bit more toward the literal end, but it's still trying to put it in good English. The Bible that I love to read when I'm just reading when I just want to read the Bible, and I'm not, I'm not studying for a lesson, I'm not, you know, but I just want to read the Bible, a lot of times I'll use the New Living Translation. It's more free, a little bit easier to read than the NIV. A little more, and, and so it's a really nice, readable version. But there's, there's, there's you, you can go to, you can download version on your, on your phone or your um, tablet, and, and you can get 30 translations on there. But they, they're, they're, they, they run the gamut here from, from literal, literal to, more, to more free. That's why we have lots of versions. And so they all have their, their, their good points. They all have their not-so-good points, but they're very, very helpful to us. And that's why we have so many versions of the Bible. Um, even though the Bible is made up of many books uh, written over a long period of time by lots of different authors, the Bible tells a story. It tells a story, and, and it's, it's an important and fascinating story. Because it's God's story, God dealing with, working with, helping to rescue his people, told over that, over that long story. And what I, I want to try to help give you more than anything is the shape of this story in the Bible. So that as you approach the Bible, as you approach different parts of the Bible, you can have in mind where, where it fits into that big story. And I, I hope, I hope that this will be helpful to you. So let's just start with the beginning. We're going we're gonna to go from, from basically from Genesis through Joshua uh, on this little, little stretch right here, okay? So, let's start with Genesis. The word Genesis means beginning, and Genesis starts at the beginning of time. God creates the world. And it, now, Genesis doesn't tell us how God created it, just that he spoke it, he willed it, he made it happen. Um, a, lot, a lot of people get hung up on all you know the Bible. It, you know, God had to create it in seven days. It talks about you know seven you know six days you know in the seven day. Okay, that 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 may be literal. That may not be literal. The, the the Bible doesn't try to tell us how God did it, but tries to communicate that God did this. God made this happen. He designed it. We are here for a purpose, and it and it's God's purpose. So, God creates the world, and He creates people, humans. In his image, which means, I believe, with the ability to reflect the goodness and the greatness of God throughout his creation. He created these beings, humans, who could know him and communicate him, reflect him to the creation around them. And he placed these first humans in a paradise of a garden and where, where everything was perfect and he, he dwelt there among them. And it was good. God called his creation very, very good. But when God created people, he, he desired for them to be able to choose whether or not they would belong to him, whether or not, not they, would, well, they would trust him, whether or not they would love him. He didn't want robots. He didn't want just beings that, that had no choice. And so he, he gave them a choice. He said, I'm going to make this one rule. I'm going to make one rule and and you keep that, that one rule, and, and you are in relationship with me, and you trust me, uh, because I want to make sure that you do it because you want to. And of course, you know, they broke that one rule, and they had to leave the garden. And so now they are broken people living in a now broken world. Now they are broken people in a world that includes sickness and pain and death and dying and all of that. And even though all that was true, and even though it seemed like humanity, because of their desire to be their own God, to, to, not trust, to not trust the God who made them, to not trust the God who loved them, but to say, you know, I think I know better than you. I want to do my own thing because they wanted to be their own God. Everything was broken. But God had not given up on his people. I don't think God was one bit surprised at how things turned out because God had a plan. And God was going to rescue. God was going to bring this human, race of humanity back to him. It wasn't going to be easy. It was going to happen because he had this plan. So uh, 
people began to multiply. Now, now we have, you know, uh, people begin to multiply and fill the earth, and they become more wicked and more wicked and more wicked, and just awful, awful evil. In fact, got to the point where God said, you know what, I am going to just reboot. I am going to restart this with a man who, trust me, apparently the only man, the only person he could find who did. This just says this, verse 6, verse 9, Noah was a righteous man blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with his God. He walked with God. He had this relationship with God. And so God just rebooted the whole thing through Noah. He built an ark, uh, you know, all the animals, the flood, and everything, and just, just started over. And then Noah's descendants began, once again, multiplying on all the earth. And as they began multiplying, they became more and more self-reliant and selfish, as we tend to do. And even, even a, a large group of them decided, you know what, we're going to do something awesome. We're going to make this gigantic, awesome city. We're going to build a tower that reaches to the sky. And we're going to show the world how great we are. And God, in sort of a humorous way, showed them who was in charge and just, you know, scattered them, made that, that, that nothing came of that. And so they, they continued to, to grow and multiply. And God, once again, chooses a person. He chooses a man, not, not to reboot, not to destroy the rest of humanity and start over with him again, but he chooses a man through whom he's going to rescue the world in a completely different way. And that man was Abram. We, we know him as Abraham. God told Abram to leave his home, his country, and to go to a land that he was going to show him. And God made three promises to Abraham. Here, here they are. I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Three promises. Many descendants... Land, which he tells, tells Abraham later is going to be the land of Canaan. And the whole world is going to be blessed through your descendants. Now, Abraham didn't have any kids. And he didn't for a long time. But God came through on his promise. Finally, Abraham and Sarah, his wife, had a son. And they named him Isaac. Isaac grew up. God made these same three promises to Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob. Jacob grew up. God made these same three promises to Jacob, and changed Jacob's name to Israel. Jacob had 12 sons who were going to eventually become the 12 tribes of Israel. Their descendants were going to become the 12 tribes of Israel. But before we get to there, there's this incredible drama regarding one of Jacob's sons named Joseph, who his brothers are so jealous of Joseph that they sell Joseph as a slave to Egypt. And Joseph goes through all kinds of trials, all, all kinds of struggles in Egypt. And then there's this great famine. Joseph becomes the second, after all these trials, he becomes the second most important man in Egypt, the second in charge, right next to Pharaoh. So he becomes in charge of Egypt. And through this famine, his brothers end up coming to Egypt. And they meet Joseph. And eventually, Joseph has all of his family come be with him in Egypt so he can take care of them through the famine. So Genesis closes with all the descendants of Jacob, all the Israelites, okay, in Egypt. And they're going to be there for a long time. The next book, oh, before I, before I go to the next book, some of you have kids who are like first graders through sixth graders, and, and they have, they, they, uh, teachers go through them these little Bible cards, okay? I'm going to show you one of these Bible cards, all right? Because it's just helpful to me. Um, this is the Bible card for, for Genesis that, that your kids see, okay? The first part of Genesis, Adam and Eve and Noah. The middle part of Genesis, you have the three tents. There are three men who lived in tents, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and God made these three promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Descendants, land, the whole world would be blessed through them. And then the last part of Genesis is about Joseph and how all of Jacob's descendants wind up in Egypt, okay? It's the book of Genesis. That's the way it ends. Now, when Exodus begins, uh, Exodus starts right back where, where Genesis left off and kind of races through the next 400 years this way. Now, Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, 
But the Israelites, their descendants, were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Then a new king, remember we're in Egypt, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. And this new king, who didn't care about Joseph, who didn't care about what happened hundreds of years ago, he makes slaves out of the Israelites, treats them cruelly. He oppresses, you know, he sees these people in Egypt, in his land, who are a different race than him, who have a different origin than they do, who have their strange customs, and they're afraid of them. And so he oppresses them and uh, makes them slaves. God had a plan. And God had promised Abraham years, hundreds of years earlier, God had said to Abraham, Abraham, your descendants are going to be slaves in a foreign land, but I'm going to deliver them. I'm going to deliver them out, and they're going to have their own land. And God used a man named Moses to do that. Here, I'm going to show you another little Bible card, okay? God sent Moses, one of the Israelites, and he raised him up so that he could lead the Israelites out of Egypt. And there's this huge drama. There's these ten plagues that God sends on Egypt. God has to convince Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. And there's this whole drama, and God leads them out of Egypt across the Red Sea on dry ground. You may have heard, heard that big story. And he leads them to Mount Sinai. And Mount Sinai is extremely important because it is at Mount Sinai that God makes an agreement with the Israelites. And he gives them his law, the Ten Commandments and all the rest of the law. Here's what the, the agreement is. God says, okay, Israelites, I will be your God. I have delivered you from your slavery. And I want to be your God. I want you to be my people. I will bless you. I will give you land to live in. I will cause you to prosper. I will help you. I will make your life meaningful. What I want you to do is to worship me only. Now, that was a big deal because they had been around pagan, you know, pagan deals where there's lots of gods, lots of gods. I want you to worship me only, and I want you to keep the commands that I give to you. I will be your God. You'll be under my protection. You will be my people. That's the agreement that God made with, with the Israelites there in Exodus. And the, the last part of the book of Exodus kind of tells a whole lot of these laws, uh, part of the, the law that God gave the Israelites. Now, some of you, at one time in your life, started in Genesis 1 and started reading through the Bible. And you, you got through Genesis, I, I, was, I had a lot of interesting stuff in it, uh, especially if you, you know, were using a translation you could understand. You went through Genesis, you got through Exodus, and then you came to... Leviticus. Leviticus is where many well-meaning Bible readers drown, okay? Because you get to Leviticus, and it is filled with the laws that God has given to the Israelites from Mount Sinai. And a whole bunch of these laws deal with how the priests and the Levites are going to conduct the worship of God. That's why it's called Leviticus, after the tribe of Levi, okay? So how they're going to conduct their worship, how they're to, to be toward one another. Now, there's a lot of cool things in Leviticus. God gives them these laws, like food laws and things, that, you know, they didn't know about germs back then. They had no idea. But look, now that we do, we see these laws that God gave the Israelites about how they were to do things, and they were ingenious to keep them healthy, to, to help them, you know, navigate through all the diseases and stuff that, that were rampant through there. There's all, all these things about how they're to treat each other, how they're to treat foreigners. It's like, hey, you were foreigners in a land. You know how you were treated. Here's how you are to treat foreigners. You know, all, all these kinds of, kinds of laws. And you can get drowned in them, all right? I would recommend that you kind of look through the book of Leviticus, especially if you're a first-time reader. Look through the book of Leviticus. Get the highlights through there and go on, okay? Uh, you, can, you can get into the laws of Leviticus later, but at least in my opinion, you know, don't, don't drown in it. Don't, don't quit because you're, you're, you're getting into all these laws. All right? So that's what the book of Leviticus is like. Now, in the next book, the next book is called Numbers. And the reason it's called Numbers is because there is a counting of the people, a, counting, a census, counting of the Israelites at the front of the book and a counting of the, of the, of the people at the end of the book. Now, once again, you can drown in the census, okay? You can look over, okay, these are the names. These are the 12 tribes, and they're counting. It's in the middle part of Numbers that the action happens, okay?
okay? Because in the middle part of Numbers, it tells about how the Israelites leave Mount Sinai and this, these incredible adventures they have through 40 years of wandering in the wilderness before they enter the land of Canaan. Now, it shouldn't have taken 40 years to get to Canaan. They actually got near Canaan in a very pretty short amount of time, a matter of months. But they sent 12 spies into the land to go, hey, go check out the land, tell us what's there. They sent spies in the land. The 12 spies come back. Ten of them are going, oh, the land is great, but the people are huge, and the, the cities are gigantic, and their walls are high, they're fortified. And they're, we, can't, we can't go in there. They will crush us. They are giants. We have no chance against these people. Of course, two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, were like, no, God has given us this land. We can go in. We can take possession of this land. He can do it. But, of course, you can imagine which side the Israelites sided with. They did not trust God. They rebelled against God. They, they wanted to go back to Egypt. Why did you lead us out here to die from these giants who are going to kill us? And so they rebelled against God's purpose for them. God was extremely unhappy. God said, because you don't trust me, I, you are going to wander in this wilderness for 40 years until all of you adults die, and I'm going to take your kids into Canaan. I'm going to take your kids into the land that I promised them. And that's what happens. They wander in that wilderness, go from place to place for 40 years until now a new generation comes up. Now, the next book, we've gone through Genesis where with the beginning, Exodus, where they leave Egypt, Leviticus, laws, numbers, wandering in the wilderness, we get to Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy is where they have come to the land of Canaan after the 40 years, and Moses addresses this new generation of Israelites. And he, the word Deuteronomy means second law. He repeats the law to the Israelites, to these young, new generation of Israelites. He repeats the law to them. Now, it's not just a repetition of Exodus and Leviticus. Deuteronomy, Moses kind of outlines, this is what God has done for us. This, this is the history of our people. And Moses gets into the heart of the laws and their meaning, and he really highlights some of the main things that, he, that God wants them to understand. It's in Deuteronomy where Moses says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. That's, that's what Jesus said was the greatest commandment right there. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Teach your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. So Deuteronomy, it, it, it can be a difficult book to, to get through, but not like Leviticus, uh, because there's, there's a lot more of the heart, a lot more of the history, as Moses repeats this law to this new generation of Israelites before they enter Canaan. And at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, Moses dies. Okay, He has been the leader of the Israelites since Egypt, and now he dies. And Joshua, one of those two spies, one of those two spies who, who said, we can take the land, one of the two survivors of this 40 years, he is now the new leader. He succeeds Moses as the leader. And so Joshua, in the book of Joshua, okay, Joshua leads the Israelites. He's got an angry face on. He leads the Israelites across the Jordan River into the land of Canaan to Jericho first. You might remember the story of Jericho, walking the laws of Jericho, and all those uh, cities in the middle of the, of the land, and then the southern cities, and then the northern cities. In the book of Joshua, the Israelites conquer the, a large part of the land and they settle there. So, by the end of the book of Joshua, Joshua, now an old man, can say this. Now I am about to go the way of all the earth. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. Joshua says, what God promised to Abraham 500 years ago. It has happened. You have gotten to see it happen with your own eyes. God has fulfilled his promises. He has been faithful. The question was, will the Israelites be faithful? God has been faithful to do what he said. Will, will the Israelites then also be faithful 
to, to let God be their God, to trust him, to worship him only. Joshua's concerned about this, so, so he says this. Now, fear the Lord. Serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. But, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The Israelites respond to Joshua, and they promise, yes, we will serve the Lord. God has been faithful to us. We will be faithful to him. But as, as we'll see next week, they, as a general rule, they did not do that. They did not come through. Looking back on, uh, on the promises God, to, God made to Abraham, let's, let's look at them again, where he promised them many descendants. That happened. He promised them the land of Canaan. He gave them that. But he also made this third promise, that the whole world would be blessed through them. And by the end of Joshua, it's clear that God has kept his promises. But this third promise is still kind of a mystery. How is God going to bless the whole world through the Israelites. How's God going to do that? He will. He has a plan. But it's going to be a long-term plan. It's going to take a while before it takes shape and we see clearly what God is doing and how he plans to bless the entire world through this little nation of Israel. Um, as, as, I read, as I read the Old Testament in particular, one of the most frustrating things as you read this story, you read about the Israelites, is how, how God has this plan for them. How God has this plan to, to, to rescue them and to bless the world. And yet his people keep on screwing it up. I mean, they don't just make mistakes. They just live mistakes. They, they just don't have it together. And they continually, God's people, God gives them direction. And he, and he, he trusts them to do this. And they, they veer away. They're selfish. They make poor decision after poor decision. And they veer far off the path that God has for them. But the most encouraging thing about reading, reading the Old Testament is that even as you see God's people just blowing it and getting off track time and time again, is that God goes there with them. And He goes through that detour, and He fulfills His promises anyway. He is going to do it. His, his promises, He is going to be faithful. And it may take longer to do it. It may take detour after detour. And the Old Testament is just this one long detour. But God's going to get it done. God will finish what he started. When it comes to our lives as individuals, God has a plan for you. God has a purpose for your life. And you may have made mistake after mistake, oh, not just mistakes, just flat out getting off track, just flat out going your own way, wanting to be your own God, do your own thing. Yeah, God, I know I'm supposed to do this, but this is what I want. I'm going to be my own God. I'm going to do my own thing. And so you've made choice after choice that have veered you far off the plan, the purpose that God has for you. And you know, God will let you go down that path. And in fact, God will let you choose to be your own God and do your own thing, and He will allow you to destroy yourself. And the reason He will let you do that is because He loves you too much to force Himself on you. He will not force Himself on you. He will let it be your choice. But if you are alive, if you are still breathing, God's plan for you, His purpose for you, is not dead. No matter 
how much of a detour, no matter how much you have veered off course. And you, you look back and you say, yeah, I'm sure God had a plan for me, but I screwed it up. I messed it up. I have made so many decisions I have made that took me just way off here. And there's just no way. I can't rewind the clock and go back and redo my life. And you're right, you can't. But God will go there. He will take that detour with you. And if you will choose Him, if you will allow Him, He will accomplish His purpose in your life anyway. He has been doing that long before you were born. He has been dealing with broken people, making broken decisions, and living a broken life, and going off course far before you and I were here. And He can and will and does do it with us. Let's pray.